This evening, we have a continuation of our series on birding in and around South Africa's major cities. We've covered the likes of Cape Town, Johannesburg, Pretoria, Nelspreet, Tanin, uh, Port Elizabeth, and now we're moving on to our central uh, capital, Bloemfontein. And taking us through that tonight is Rick Nuttall. Now, Rick has been sharing his knowledge and passion uh, for birds with like-minded people from a very young age. His MSc degree involved behavioral studies of waxballs and their close relatives, the astrologic finches. And Rick joined the National Museum of Bloemfontein as an ornithologist back in 1991, undertaking research for 10 years before his appointment as director, a position he held until November 2017. Rick has authored scientific, semi-scientific, and popular ornithological publications, and contributes regularly to national bird monitoring and citizen science projects. He has led small group uh, birding trips in South Africa and Lesotho on occasion since 1993, and has traveled widely in Southern Africa. He is a keen amateur photographer and sound recordist, and Rick now plans and leads general nature and birding tours full time. He lives in Bumpertain in Central Southern South Africa, and enjoys birding his local patch. And together with local birding friends, Rick's birding big day team regularly achieves totals of around 200 species within a 50 kilometer radius of Lumpentain during this annual 24 hour event. So that gives you some idea of the man's knowledge of his local patch. Um, Rick, I'm going to invite you to turn your video on and unmute yourself. Of course, this will be a familiar face for many of you. Uh, Rick presented last year on the Golden Gate National Park as part of our AB Tourism series on birding in our National Parks Network. And he also gave a talk at the African Bird Fair last year on the virtues of birding at Sut during Nature Reserve, which I'm sure we'll get a little bit more about tonight as well. So Rick, very, uh, very warm welcome to you. Welcome back to the platform. And it's wonderful to have you. Thanks very much, Andrew. I uh, just want to check that you can hear me. I can hear you just fine. I can see you just Good. fine. And I'll invite there we you go. to share your screen. There we go. Right, all good. Wonderful, thank you, Rick. Take it away. Andrew, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good evening, friends from uh, wherever you may be. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening for uh, what I hope will be uh, an enlightening um, uh, introduction to the birding opportunities in and around Bloemfontein in the central free state in central South Africa. Um, just a few facts about birds and birding around uh, Bloemfontein before I start by way of introduction. As Andrew mentioned in my, uh, you know, while introducing me, the birding big day totals are usually between 185 and 195 species in the 24 hour period. And our record uh, for this area within 50 Ks of Bloemfontein is 208 species in 24 hours. So uh, for those of you who just, uh, drive through uh, the Free State and uh, en route from uh, Gauteng to the Cape or vice versa and uh, are just keen to travel through and uh, get the journey over with as soon as possible, uh, look at those numbers. Um, they, 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 speak, uh, they speak volumes. So just the context of these species totals, um, 200 in, in the central part of the South Africa is probably the same as 300 plus in the more diverse areas of, uh, of South Africa for a birding big day total. Um, <clears throat> just the, the, some of what we would refer to as special local bird species, um, and I'll, tell, I'll go into a little bit more detail about this. Um, they might be quite common in other parts of the country, but uh, you know, what we term as special here is something that is, is, is quite unusual and quite rare for um, from a birding perspective for the the central part of South Africa. Local knowledge is key. Um, Andrew alluded to this, you know, I think being part of a birding big day team, you get to know your area really well. Um, you uh, know where birds are, you know the habitats well, and um, this is, is key to benefiting as much as possible from birds and birding in uh, the Bloemfontein area. 
Um, there are diverse habitats in, in the surrounding areas around Bloemfontein. And this is one of the main reasons why we get the kind of totals that we do on birding big day. Um, but of course, you need to know where to go and you need to know where these habitats are. Uh, fortunately, we have a fairly good network of public roads. So accessibility to birding areas is good. We also have an, uh, a number of um, conservation areas that are open to the public. Sudurang being the main one close to Bloemfontein, Sudurang Nature Reserve, and I'll dwell a little bit on that towards the end of my presentation. Um, yes, there are potholes and corrugations, but I, I think that we don't escape, none of us escape uh, um, those, those hassles when we're out birding wherever we are in the country. But um, the fact of the matter is there's a good network of roads um, accessing most of these different habitats. So it's quite easy to get around and get to see these different bird species. Um, we also, obviously, with our local knowledge, we uh, have access to private property, which can be arranged should uh, birders be visiting and keen to see certain species. And um, yeah, certain of our what we would term our local specials uh, are on private property only. Um, and so if you're wanting to see those, we can, uh, you know, we can arrange for access to these properties. I'm going to just go into a little bit more detail on, uh, on these points. But um, um, yeah, you know, just our, our, our birding big day um, uh, team here, three of the four. The fourth one is me taking the photograph. This is on, a, on, a, on an early morning, um, just before sunrise in Sudurang Nature Reserve along the Morda River part in the reserve. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the number of different bird species that are possible um, are, you know, is, is, is noteworthy for this area. Uh, if you consider that it's, you know, it's, it doesn't have the highest rainfall and it doesn't compare favorably in terms of the huge diversity that is to be found bird-wise in the north and the east of, of South Africa. Um, yeah, and uh, I just mentioned the context of these species totals. I think that we would compare well if uh, you know on a handicap um, uh, arrangement with some of the, the, the top birding big day teams in the country. Uh, and folks, this is not open for discussion here. <laughs> um, but if people want to contact me, uh, you know, uh, uh, offline to to have a chat about uh, about comparing. Uh, a, a total of 208 or 200 in Bloemfontein to, you know, 300 plus 320 up in the uh, in the in the north and northeast of the country. Um, you're welcome to do so. Um, just some of our special bird species. These are just a few um, wonderful endemics. Some really really stunning birds. The endemic blue Koran, uh, which is a bird very much of the grasslands. Um, Orange of Franklin, this is a, a really a special bird here and you've got a very good chance of seeing Orange of Franklin uh, in, in a number of places around Bloemfontein. Um, Swallowtail bee eater, uh, birds move in during winter and um, very close to where I live, they, uh, they, they roost in eucalyptus gum trees um, and uh, it's always wonderful to connect with them uh, each, each year when, they, when they're back. Um, this is a pretty special bird, the melodious lark. I think that the, um, the grasslands in the central interior are possibly the core of their, of their range. Um, interesting bird that, uh, you know, is present in very good numbers after good rains, uh, particularly when the roycrus or Thamida triandra is, is nice and, uh, nice and tall. And, um, uh, these birds, you know, really it's a cacophony of sound in spring and summer when they are up and they're doing their flight displays over open grassland. One of the, uh, one of the special experiences, and for me, who's uh, very interested and keen on, on, on sound and, and sound recordings and the sounds that birds and other wildlife make, this is a real treat, is to be out early in the morning in the grasslands to hear uh, in, yeah, more than quadraphonic sound. Um, all of the displaying melodious locks. So that's a very special bird and you can see it on the outskirts of Bloemfontein. Uh, Namako warbler, again, this is a bird of the, of the reed beds um, along the river systems in the central interior and further to the west. 
And so this is a bird that we can easily connect with um, Sudurin Nature Reserve being one of the best places to find um, this little bird. Uh, orange River white eye, uh, very widespread in the in the in the more um, drier sort of western regions of South Africa, um, but this is um, they're resident here. So if you are travelling through and you hear or see white eyes, they will probably be Orange River. We do get Cape white eyes, the grey bellied Cape white eyes, moving in seasonally. Um, they come in normally around May or June for uh, for a month or two, but the Orange River is the resident. And what a stunning little bird uh, this is. Um, we're right on the eastern edge of the range uh, of black-headed canaries, but we do get them within the greater Bloemfontein area, um, um, sometimes during winter, more so than, than, than summer. And it's always beautiful, you know, to connect with these stunning little canaries. So these are some of what we would term our local specials. Um, and uh, yeah, we've we've spent a lot of time, um, you know, getting to know the areas. Uh, I've been living in, in Bloemfontein now for over 30 years and, and, and birding consistently uh, in and around Bloemfontein. And um, yeah, it's, um, I'm constantly reminded of how special it is as a, as a, as a birding area. Um, in the context of the, the birds that we do find here. Yeah, so uh, where is Bloemfontein? Um, this is just to give you a context to uh, where we are situated, particularly for those folk who might be tuning in from outside of South Africa. Um, the tip of the arrow might not be, uh, it might not mark the spot exactly, um, but it's thereabouts to just to the right of the head of the arrow. You can see uh, the sort of square of the Maluti Mountains. That's the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. Um, so it gives you an idea. Uh, we are situated in the central interior of South Africa. Um, it's primarily grassland in these areas, but uh, as you go further west, you're getting into the more drier, um, semi-arid and arid areas of, uh, of our region. If we zoom in a little bit, um, apologies for the quality of this, but just um, the circle down here on the bottom right um, signifies Bloemfontein. I've got a few arrows showing important um, um, water courses, water systems, rivers, streams um, that uh, are all essential in increasing the diversity of habitats that we have in the greater Bloemfontein area. Um, and I'm going to show photographs and talk a bit more about habitats uh, straight after this. Um, and up in the just left of, of top center, I've circled um, the Kruger's Drift Dam and the Sudurin Nature Reserve, which essentially is around the, um, the green of the um, um, Kruger's Drift Dam. And that is a, a, a key birding area close to Bloemfontein. It's a, it's a mere 40 kilometers um, out of town and um, easy to get there. And uh, yeah, but on the, on the outskirts of, of the city of Bloemfontein itself, there's some wonderful areas and I'm going to touch on just a couple of those um, where some very special birds uh, are waiting to be found. Right, so let's look at the, uh, the habitat diversity um, in the areas surrounding uh, Bloemfontein. Um, on the top left is the uh, picture taken in the, in the Free State National Botanical Gardens. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about that because it's one of our prime birding spots right on the, uh, on the edge of town. And you can see there um, a, a dam with water. Uh, the level of that dam fluctuates, so the amount of emergent vegetation and shoreline, exposed shoreline available for, uh, as, as foraging habitat for birds, um, does vary considerably. But you, excuse me, you can see open water, um, fairly well wooded uh, banks of the dam, and then the small hills in the background, all vegetated with natural um, vegetation, it's mainly wild olive trees and, um, and uh, uh, career trees, um, uh, searsia trees. So um, a wonderful, provides a wonderful, um, um, you know, bunch of habitats 
within a relatively small area. Then you have the, the, the gardens as well with a lot of indigenous plants, uh, many of them flowering plants, and they attract all manner of bird species. So um, this just, I put that in just to give you an idea of, of you know, the diversity of habitat with open water, hillsides, um, rock, rocky slopes, um, and then of course the gardens. And then uh, in the bottom right is a picture taken out at Sutra and Nature Reserve, but again it's to show the wetland habitats. And these are the, um, the uh, areas of the Kruger's Drift Dam which back up when the river is in spate, uh, when the water levels are high, and you've got these short grass areas as well as um, thorn felt thickets uh, in conjunction with those. So a wonderful combination of habitats providing um, feeding, uh, resting, roosting, breeding uh, areas for a host of different bird species. Okay, and then we've got, um, again, river systems. I've already mentioned the importance of river systems. And this is um, at the top is the Moda River pushing up into one of its um, one of its sort of tributaries areas. Um, at when the water levels are high, this is in Sudra and Nature Reserve again. And bottom right is is another uh, man-made impoundment dam. Uh, I think it's on the Renosta River, um, Renosta Sprait, which is a smaller tributary of the Moda River. This is close to Bloemfontein. Um, but these river systems are the lifeline um, uh, of the area. And of course, along these river systems, you have uh, very often um, reed beds, but also uh, fairly thick river iron bush and thicket. And then we move out into the more open areas. Um, <clears throat> the picture top right is taken uh, in an area southwest of Bloemfontein. That is a well-known landmark called Tafelkop, um, table, uh, table Head, uh, the, the mountain you can see. Um, but then there's also so, you know, some rocky hillsides and large areas of flatlands, which are essentially covered in grass. So the grasslands and after good rain, the grasslands can be uh, really, really... Um, very thickly vegetated with grass, sometimes up to uh, a meter and a half high. And um, these provide uh, habitats for all manner of bird species, different bird species to those that would have been in the habitats I've uh, been talking about previously. And the photograph on the bottom left, again, Sutra and Nature Reserve, the open grassland areas, um, which are wonderful for Korans, for courses, uh, larks, pipits, uh, cysticulars, and things like that. Frankillans as well. Um, <clears throat> then on the top left here is uh, an area close to Bloemfontein, um, a place called Kurfaint, and I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, but this again is 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 the, uh, comprises these typical Karoo, uh, no, sorry. Um, uh, free state hills uh, that are vegetated with um, with wild olives and the Korea CSEA species as the predominant species with grass cover as well. So uh, lots of fruit, lots of insects um, uh, available for uh, birds living in these areas. And then bottom right, again, a combination of uh, rocky hillsides with, with grassland in between. This is out uh, near an area called Glen, which is um, sort of south, north east of the city. And when it rains, we very often get inundated grasslands, such as the um, picture taken up on the top left, shown on the top left. Um, this is on a wonderful road that skirts the north and northeast of the city. And it's here where um, one is, is uh, able to find melodious locks displaying in good numbers uh, in, in, in summertime, particularly after good rains. This is also where we get a number of skulking species, a number of rallids move in. Uh, we have had African crake, um, possibly also Balon's crake, uh, in, uh, African crake in good numbers in recent years in this area. 
We get white-winged widow birds moving in, which they, um, they only do in, in years of very good rainfall. Um, of course, driving along these roads, you'll have African quail finches flying up in their dozens. They love to come down and drink and bathe at these uh, roadside pools. Um, not bird related, but you also very often have the giant bullfrogs breeding in these uh, roadside pools. And it's fascinating to see the whole life cycle of, uh, of these amazing amphibians taking place uh, so close to the city. And then as many uh, uh, urban areas um, do have, uh, Bloemfontein also has its fair share of sewerage works. And the photograph in the bottom right is, uh, was taken on a birding big day uh, at the local, one of our local sewerage works, which is accessible. Um, uh, I would not advise going there alone, but if you go along with a group of people, um, it's accessible and you can see wonderful water birds, um, a whole host of different duck species, um, a black-eared grebe, little grebe, sometimes great crested grebe, and um, yeah, many, many waterfowl species. So that's also an area on the outskirts of the city. <coughs> Excuse me. And then another important habitat in the greater Bloemfontein area comprises uh, natural pans. These are shallow pans that are dry for much of the year, but after good rainfall, events, they, they fill up and they're very productive. Um, they are, sometimes have high salt concentrations. And so you, you know, you get the associated animal life that, uh, um, that, that comes to life when, when, uh, when these pans of water and very often you'll have good flocks of flamingos, avocets, black wing stilts, and species like that on, uh, on these shallow pans. And there are a number of these, particularly to the west and northwest of the city. And then of course, the fringing grasslands, um, which are extensive in these areas too. I mentioned earlier that uh, you know one of the benefits of of the Greater Bloemfontein area and the and the um, advantages from the burning point of view is the fact that we have a good public road network and many of the birds that are on offer are visible from the public roads, so there's no need to uh, you know really spend a lot of time off the public roads, um, and so it's really possible to go out on these roads and and see some amazing amazing birds. I mentioned that, uh, you know, we are able to ar arrange access to private property. This is important for certain species, one in particular, and, and that is, I've already mentioned, uh, shown this photograph, the top left is a, an area called Cliff Ant. It's about 18 k's south west of Bloemfontein. And um, the other one picture is a, a farm called Bishop's Glen, very, uh, very well known to, to, to um, our local birders and our bird club here in Bloemfontein. Uh, that's out um, to the northeast of Bloemfontein, about the same distance, about 20 kilometers. But the special bird at Kleurfaint uh, is the African rock pipit. And this is the closest locality to Bloemfontein where you'll find the species. And um, so we go out there with visiting birders quite often. Other specials that occur in this area would be short-toed rock thrush, uh, fairy flycatcher, Cape Penduline tit, uh, both cinnamon breasted and Cape bunting. Uh, Malachite sunbird is, uh, is common here. And uh, we often see booted eagle up in this area as well. Um, in some of the thorn felt areas, which are a bit further to the, uh, to the south of this picture, uh, golden breasted bunting occurs as well. Uh, as, and also violet red waxbill, green wing partilia and things like that. So it does add to the diversity of uh, possible birds close to Bloemfontein. Okay, let's go to a couple of, uh, I'm just going to spend some time in, 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 at, a, at a few of the local hotspots. And the first of these is the Free State National Botanical Garden. And this is just to the north of, um, of Bloemfontein on the northern outskirts of town. It borders on the National Motorway, the N1, um, that many people uh, who are listening to this and watching this evening have traveled. Um, 
And uh, so I've shown some of the photographs of uh, botanical gardens and it provides a wonderful uh, diversity, a microcosm of, of habitats in the greater Bloemfontein area and, um, and an associated bird list to, to go with that. So um, yeah, these, these hills are great for a number of species and I'm just gonna touch on a few of them. Um, uh, the larger trees in these valleys um, are frequented by uh, black sparrowhawk and um, the area where I live, which is just down, um, you know, downstream of, uh, of the National Botanical Gardens, uh, has an, a, 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 you know, um, good numbers of, of large eucalyptus trees. And um, as many will know where uh, these exotic trees are, uh, this has been favorable for the expansion, extension of the distribution range of a number of raptor species, including uh, the black sparrowhawk and the rufous chested sparrowhawk. Um, so both species are found fairly frequently in these areas and um, you, can, you can often see them flying overhead uh, when walking in the botanical gardens. Uh, another special um, sort of uh, arid, semi-arid, dry western uh, uh, member of the of the of the flycatcher family, the battises. This is the prurit battis, a, a female has the more more colourful colouring on the, on the throat and chest. That's the bird on the left, and the male with the with the the broad black chest band. Um, they are very common in uh, you know in any wooded areas in and around Bloemfontein, particularly along watercourses. It's always nice to catch up with them in uh, in the uh, botanical gardens. And then on top of the kopis, uh, the little hills, if you walk up on top, um, that's where you'll find Karoo scrub robin, which is another nice uh, endemic species to find. Um, always very busy, quite noisy. Um, and uh, so if, you, if you're after this species to add to your list, the, uh, the hilltops, uh, with, um, which are accessed by, by good paths in the botanical gardens are the place to go. Uh, another species that occurs up there is the grey-back cisticula, another one of our endemics. Um, and um, another two interesting species that can be found, uh, they're not there all year round, um, but they, they, they do move in. There's the Layard's warbler, tit babbler as it used to be, and then the little uh, dainty little fairy flycatcher, which uh, as, Many birders in, in uh, South Africa know is a winter migrant moving away from its breeding areas, uh, its core breeding areas in the in the Karoo. Um, and they head up as far north as Gauteng and I think even a little bit further north than Gauteng in the winter. We have a fairy flycatchers throughout the year in Bloemfontein, but the numbers swell quite significantly during the winter months and botanical gardens is a good place to, uh, is to go and uh, find them. Sunbirds are, are um, quite common in the botanical gardens, um, in the more in the cultivated sections of the garden where they have aloes and uh, the wild dacha leonotus plants in profusion. And um, perhaps the most common of our sunbird species is the white bellied, shown up on top right, uh, a beautiful male. And then Malachite sunbird here, a picture of a bird in, in transition plumage. It's molting into its breeding plumage. Uh, and this will be a picture taken during the uh, winter or early spring when the aloes are in flower. And you can see some of the Malachite green feathers appearing on this, uh, this um, male bird uh, feeding at the, at the, at the aloe. And then we do have uh, amethyst sunbird as well. Um, I, I'm not sure if they're resident. Um, they probably are in very, very low numbers, um, but they do move through. Um, I keep very you know, detailed records of birds in my garden. And in fact, all of these pictures were taken in, in my garden. Um, so they also come to the, uh, the wild dacha, the leonotus. And then uh, very rarely we get the dusky sunbird. Uh, this is very much a bird of the dry west. Um, and uh, it's amazing. Many people have spoken about the advantages of hard lockdown. Um, I was out in the garden or observing birds in the garden uh, for most of the day, each day. And um, I had a, this individual dusky sunbird, male dusky sunbird, moving through and spending up 
five, maybe 10 minutes at a time in the garden, quickly um, sipping nectar from the, uh, from the, the, the flowers before being chased off by uh, both white-bellied and um, the resident uh, male malachite. So um, yeah, and botanical gardens has these species as well. I do have a number of records of dusky in the botanical gardens too. So a nice selection of, uh, of sunbirds. And then up on the up on the hillsides, we get our, our smallest little bird uh, in South Africa, the Cape Penduline tit, uh, not the lightest, the fairy flycatcher is the lightest by a, by a gram or two, but this is our shortest, smallest little uh, bird, the Cape Penduline tit, and um, perched on top of a, um, a uh, sage bush. And always good to see them. Um, Orange River white I've uh, already mentioned this species. It's very, very common. And, uh, you know, anybody who, who stops to refuel at one of the engine garages on the N1, uh, you listen out and look out for these birds. You'll pick up Orange River white eye very quickly, I'm sure. Um, Yellow-bellied Eremomola, another common uh, bird of the, of the hillsides in the botanical gardens, the vegetated hillsides. And Interestingly enough, the, while the common fire finch in these areas is red billed, we do have a number of records of Jamison's fire finch. And this was a bird photographed close to Bloemfontein on the, on the outskirts of town. I've in fact had them in my garden as well. So just a nice, uh, a nice selection of interesting and, uh, and, and quite special little birds that occur in the botanical gardens. Uh, canaries, we do get yellow canary, that's a lovely male, and then the black-throated canary with its uh, bright yellow rump, uh, otherwise quite a nondescript little canary. And they're also very, very common in, in the botanical gardens and, and areas that are similar uh, with similar habitats. Okay, um, I'm now going to um, take you on a, on a virtual birding route which is a road a gravel road you can see there that skirts the um, the northern part of town and um, it goes essentially from west to to east or southeast around uh, around town you're never more than five or, or eight kilometers from the city center and uh, so these are just some of the of the habitats you can see the picture on the top right um, is a, an inundated area. Uh, it's actually a, an old crop cropland, um, but after good rains, there's a lovely wetland that develops there and it's always worth a stop. So it's one of our regular uh, birding spots when, there's, when it's holding water um, and it provides wonderful habitat for a number of different water associated species. And then of course, the, uh, the open grasslands in the area um, are also uh, you know numerous so uh, it provides some wonderful habitat and then um, I'll show you pictures but we also cross little streams with the associated woody vegetation. Uh, the wetland is home to a number of waterfowl species, uh, common species such as the yellow bull duck, blacksmith lapwing, um, but we've also had whiteback duck, southern pochard, red bull teal, a number of the uh, egret species, such as little egret, great egret, um, squawker heron. Um, yeah, and perhaps the most, uh, uh, um, the, the most celebrated bird species that we have pitching up from time to time is the greater painted snipe. And this is a very special bird for us here. So um, always a good one to see. And if there is water, um, good water in that, in that wetland, um, there's a very good chance of finding greater painted snipe there. Um, in the area also you get a number of the, um, the sort of dry grassland species coming in to drink. Pink-billed lark is one of the specials. We have red-capped larks, we have grey-backed sparrow larks um, coming in there as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's always good to be able to link up with pink-billed larks and quite a number of the birders coming to the Bloemfontein area um, this is a species that we're able to show them and they're very pleased about that. Uh, this is one of the streams um, that the road uh, crosses and you can see uh, large gum trees in the background that also provides habitat for bird species. But these, these thickets, these wooded um, um, 
uh, margins of these streams and small rivers provide wonderful habitat. And we've had um, a number of interesting species. Um, Brubru is a species that we get from time to time in this, uh, along this watercourse. Uh, we've also had olive tree warbler. Um, we get other warblers as well during summertime. And um, it's really, really nice. Uh, greater striped swallows and white-throated swallows breed under the bridge right here. So it's always nice to see uh, them close up, white rumped swifts as well. Um, and in the uh, vegetation along the roadsides and close to the streams, we you have uh, a whole bunch of smaller passerines, including species such as the black-chested prinia. I've already shown this photograph of the waterlogged grasslands, um, and I've spoken about uh, the melodious larks that occur here. Uh, melodious because they mimic all sorts of other species. It's interesting, the, the Afrikaans name is very apt, sport leverick. Uh, sport is to, to joke, to play with, and of course that's what they're doing vocally. They are um, really, really messing with us. Um, but uh, wonderful to try and uh, to try and uh, do analyze the songs and to see how many different species uh, are being mimicked by this very very accomplished songster, and they will you know be in display flight for many many minutes on end. I remember doing a recording down at Kharangboom, uh, which many birders will know down uh, near Springfontein in the Southern Free State, and it was howling. Uh, it was a howling wind blowing. And there was one particular male up in this display flight for in excess of 20 minutes uh, in that very, very strong wind. Uh, there's a picture of a bird in display flight. Uh, they're very characteristic, broad wings, and they have this uh, very shallow, what I call almost butterfly flight pattern. And uh, that tail that is, uh, is kept folded in and narrow. Um, all the time while the bird's up in, uh, up in its display flight. Another uh, special lark that we get in these areas is the Eastern Clapper Lark, uh, not to be confused with the Cape Clapper Lark, which is the one you get down in the Karoo and further to the Western Cape and to the West Coast. Um, but the Eastern Clapper Lark with its lovely clapping um, uniform, uh, um, rapid clapping that it does as it rises and then as it descends from its display flight, it gives that um, ascending whistle. Again, in summer, you can imagine the, uh, the soundscapes uh, that you know, consist of displaying melodious larks, displaying eastern clapper larks. You've got all the cesticulars up in display. You've got rufous-napped larks calling. You've got red-capped larks in display. And throw in the odd large-billed lark if you're in the drier areas. And it's, uh, it's an amazing place to be, it really is. And then another amazing experience that I had uh, one day when I was out in these grasslands just driving along the road was uh, to experience five different black-chested snake eagle individuals. And these were just three. And you can see they're different ages, just on the basis of their plumage. The one at the top is an adult bird. Um, bottom right is a, is a sub-adult bird and the and bottom left is, a, is an immature bird. And there were another two individuals and they were all um, just hovering over the grassland and dropping down every now and then to catch something in the grass. Um, hovering as, as only snake eagles can do, well, this particular species of snake eagle. And uh, so, um, and I've seen them on, an, on numerous occasions out in these grasslands. And that's in the picture in the bottom left, you can actually see houses in the background. Um, and so that's how close they are to the outskirts of the city. Uh, in, in the grassland areas and close to this, um, South African cliff swallows uh, in, in summertime, they are abundant. And any of you who've driven along the freeway, you will have seen uh, under the road bridges, the nests of the cliff swallows. Very often, they're also little swifts. Um, uh, breeding under the same bridges. They will sometimes utilize the cliff swallow nests. White-throated swallows will take over the cliff swallow nests, but little swifts also will construct their own nests, but they're in mixed colonies. Um, and uh, interesting question, 
you know, where did these birds nest before we came along and built road bridges for them to nest under? I've only ever once seen a cliff swallow colony on a natural rocky cliff, uh, and it was an old disused colony down in the southern Free State. But um, so you'll see them foraging over the grasslands on this particular route as well, um, because the N1 is nearby and the bridges are, are right there. And then, as I mentioned, uh, it's also a wonderful place to get to grips with uh, a whole bunch of cysticulars. Um, we have, in particular in summer, and particularly in, in, in wet seasons, we have desert cysticular, which is our resident uh, cysticular. And then we have cloud cysticular and um, zitting cysticular moving in as well. And in the areas of rank grass along the watercourses in particular and road verges, levalon cysticular too. So, a wonderful opportunity and Nediki in the in the more bush bushy areas. So you've got an opportunity to really get to grips with the differences um, in not only the plumage patterns, but tail length, the displays, um, and the behavior of uh, these cysticular species. So um, these grasslands in summer are a really special place to be. Uh, we now jumping to the south of town. Um, this is a um, <clears throat> a yeah, very highly polluted small dam uh, that is pretty much surrounded, um, if not on three sides, on two sides by informal settlements, uh, but provides wonderful habitat for a number of interesting bird species, including uh, greater flamingos. But in amongst them, you can see um, pied avocets, their blacksmith lapwings, red-billed teal, uh, white faced whistling duck, and um, a few years ago, we had a very, very special visitor, a celebrity who turned up. Here is um, the uh, red phalarope uh, that, is, uh, that spent all of a few weeks um, swimming and feeding in amongst all the garbage uh, in this very polluted uh, dam. Um, if it wasn't for one of our local birders, Johan van Ica, going out and checking on, on these localities every now and then, we would never have uh, known that this bird was there. So thank you, Johan, for all the, all the hard work and the hours that uh, you spend going around to these out of the way places and seeing what pitches up. At the same time, there, was a, there, was a, there were a number of white wing turns. This is a non-breeding white wing turn um, about to dip into the surface of the dam. <clears throat> okay, um, we're now heading southwest of Bloemfontein. Uh, this is probably about 40, 40 kilometers southwest, but this is a wonderful route to drive if you're wanting to see blue cranes. Um, and uh, there are a number of uh, pairs that breed here year in and year out during the breeding season. An area of dry grassland, um, but also these um, these uh, vegetated hills. Um, but other, other species that are, that are common in these grassland areas are of course blue Koran, uh, the northern black Koran. You can see a bird here with the white quills, the white um, uh, wing feathers, which are very different to the black, all black wing of the southern black Koran, which you get further down into the Karoo and down into the Cape, into the Western Cape. Um, and then uh, a number of coarser species, um, three coarser species, in fact, that I do get from time to time here all together. Uh, this is a double band of courses shown here, but we also get Birchall's Corsa and Temex courses. Um, Birchall's probably in this area more regularly than Temex. And um, yeah, I, I generally travel, you know, I, I, I do a bird count in this area in, at the end of January and the end of July each year. And uh, yeah, on, on, on many occasions when I do these counts, I pick up all three species of courses. So that's always the area that I uh, point people to if they're looking particularly for Birchall's course around Bloemfontein. And then I mentioned Orange River Franklin is, uh, you know, is quite common in these areas around Bloom. So if you're wanting to get good views of Orange River Franklin, there are a number of places and they're quite territorial. So um, uh, they, you should be able to 
connect with them uh, if you do a bit of birding around Bloemfontein. I have them as garden birds um, because I had a pair that was resident in the area for a number of, uh, of months. And uh, in fact, the picture top right was taken of a bird right next to the garage. Um, and, uh, and what amazing birds to, to have nearby and calling and, uh, and, you know, scratching around in your garden. But Orange River Franklin are very nice uh, birds to connect with. And then a number of lark species in these uh, drier grasslands. This is large-billed lark. Um, they're quite common. Um, and interestingly enough, fawn-colored lark. That's a bird you can get on the outskirts of Bloemfontein. You don't have to go as far as this route. Um, I have uh, picked them up uh, yeah, two, three kilometers west of Bloemfontein um, on occasion. Sickle wing chats uh, move into the area in, in wintertime, uh, possibly birds moving down from the uh, high mountains of uh, the Malutis and the Drakensberg at Lesotho, and they come into, the, uh, into these dry grassland areas in the interior. We always see them in winter. And then a very, very special little endemic, one of my favorites is the rufous eared warbler. And so any bushy areas, particularly um, yeah, not, not particularly, uh, they're not restricted to hills, you know, hillsides and low, low lying slopes, but where there's bush, even low bush, uh, in these drier grassland areas, you should have, uh, good numbers of rufous head warblers and you, you hear them calling and then they're always quite inquisitive, um, if you're nearby. And then I mentioned earlier the black-headed canaries. <clears throat> Uh, in wintertime at one of the water points along the route that I drive, um, had flocks of these, of these delightful little birds coming in and um, blow me down. There was a Demora uh, subspecies, the one with the white on the head as well. Uh, that was at the same spot. And this is probably 45 kilometers west, southwest of Bloemfontein. Okay, then we have a change in the seasons. Uh, come this time of the year, October, um, you get the development of, uh, of thunderstorms and, and rain. And uh, of course, that brings in the changing seasons and migrants. And so I want to talk a little bit about some special migrants and concentrations of those migrants that, uh, you know, that we're very fortunate to experience here in and around Bloemfontein. Firstly, the um, European bee eater, normally around the 9th of September, I expect to hear the first krup, krup, krup calls of overflying birds. Sometimes it's not birds that are here to stay, but birds flying further south, migrating further south. But from around uh, the, the 10th to the 12th of, uh, of September each year, that's when the European bee eaters arrive. Now, we do have... Uh, they, they belong to two different populations. The one is, an, is a non-breeding uh, visitor from, from Europe, and the other is a breeding visitor from North Africa. And um, we are very fortunate to have a number of roost sites, and those would probably be the non-breeding birds in large trees in close to the city center in Bloemfontein. So one can have that wonderful experience of European bee eaters coming to roost every evening. Um, they fly over our, our home en route to their roost sites. Uh, there are a number of these roost sites, but the other thing that uh, you can experience in and around Bloemfontein is the actual breeding activity of um, small groups of the breeding uh, subspecies or population of European bee eaters. And they breed in, in, um, in, um, Earthen embankments uh, on, I know of one particular site you know, on the uh, western outskirts of Bloemfontein. So always nice to have these migrants. And then uh, we also get these gatherings of these tiny little black dots and you can often miss this, but um, if you're observant and watch, um, you see the the birds getting together and going to roost and these are of course barn swallows. Um, we have a number of uh, areas that where they where they do roost. Um, they don't roost in the same areas every year but they seem to move around but some of the roosts can can probably number in the hundreds of thousands um, 
other roosts are sometimes a lot smaller than that. But uh, another uh, long distance migrant that we have the privilege of experiencing um, here and having them uh, gathering at roost sites during their non-breeding season. And then uh, two of the small migratory falcons, um, or kestrels, this is the lesser kestrel, and then the ammer falcon is the other one. Um, we have historical roosts in the, on the eastern side of town in large gum trees and in uh, stands of gum trees. When I arrived in Bloemfontein uh, 25, 30 years ago, uh, there were very few ammer falcons in the roosts in summer, and we, um, we did annual counts. Uh, they were predominantly lesser kestrels, but as time has gone on, the ammer falcons have uh, become more numerous, the lesser kestrels less so. And now the roosts, if they are used, they uh, are used predominantly by ammer falcons, with a smattering of, um, of red-footed falcons uh, in, uh, in the roost sites as well. So again, one of these incredible spectacles to see, and I've taken European uh, visitors, birders, out to go and see these massive concentrations of thousands of these small kestrels. They are familiar with them, you know, in very small numbers, breeding uh, in old stone walls and old buildings. And to see the spectacle of thousands of these birds coming into roost is quite something for them. So very, very special. And then not a regular occurrence, but another migrant that uh, we get. And if they are here, they're often in good numbers. Uh, is the uh, black-winged pretenkol. And um, these photographs were taken out at Sudurang uh, in December 2019. But what a spectacle that was. There must have been a good few thousand of them. And um, there are reports, historical reports, um, in, in, you know, in recent history of hundreds of thousands of birds roosting um, in... Um, old ploughed lands in the central free state. So I think that this central um, part of the country provides a core um, non-breeding uh, habitat for blackwing, for the global population of blackwing pratting coals. So always really nice to see them and, and, and to watch them wheeling in these large flocks. Um, I had an incredible experience once. Uh, I was out to the southwest of Bloemfontein driving in the grassland, stopped got out and within no time I had a flock of thousands of these birds coming and hawking insects within, you know, within arm's length of me flying past, whizzing past at, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, uh, one, one and a half meters above the ground. And it was one of those experiences I'll never forget. Okay, um, I think it's uh, only right that uh, I should also include Sudra in Nature Reserve in a talk about birds and birding in the greater Bloemfontein area. Um, and what a special place this is. Um, I hope I remember to mention one of the sayings that, uh, that, that, that have been coined, a phrase that's been coined about Sudurang and the birds uh, and the birds one can possibly see at Sudurang. I'll, I'll try and remember it at the end. But anyway, the Sudurang is, is amazing. It has, it has water, it's, it's a dam. Uh, a reserve around a dam, uh, an impoundment on the Moda River, um, you know, north northwest of Bloemfontein, and um, it just provides amazing habitat for birds. And um, yeah, I've already shown some of these photographs, so these are just the habitats there. Uh, very, very good grasslands for secretary bird. We see them on most of our, uh, you know, our trips out to Sudurang, our visits. Uh, always nice to see secretary birds. Uh, capped wheat ear um, is another species that is quite common out, particularly in the in the drier areas of the reserve where there are open patches of ground and and, uh, and small bushes. Kalahari scrub robin. We've already spoken about Karoo scrub robin. Kalahari scrub robin is 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 very common, particularly along the along the uh, uh, woodland along the Moda River. But Karoo scrub robin does occur there as well, so you can get two scrub robin species. Um, and on occasion, particularly when the water levels are low and the um, the upper reaches of the of the dam uh, are are dry, um, Namaqua sandgrass move in, and they have been known to breed in this area as well. 
So it's always nice to hear them and even more so to see them in the area. Uh, waterfowl, uh, many, many um, in terms of numbers of individuals, but also a good diversity of species of waterfowl. I just put in a, a male South African shellduck with its lovely metallic um, uh, coloring on the, on the secondary feathers in flight. Um, there are always good numbers of these, uh, Egyptian geese, spurwing geese, but then all the smaller duck species as well. And some quite special waders. Uh, we've had um, Bartel godwit, which is a very special species uh, a number of years ago. But um, we get ruddy turnstones and um, common ring plovers, kitlets as plovers, uh, really good Good, a good variety and selection of birds. Um, along the along the um, river system, um, particularly where there's more vegetation, reed beds, and you might get African snipe. Um, so we see them there quite often. Uh, kingfishers, giant kingfisher, pied kingfisher, brown hooded kingfisher away from the water, of course, being insectivorous, and little malachite kingfishers. This is a young bird down on the right. Um, they're pretty common along the, along the river systems and in the smaller pans. And we've also, in fact, had a grey hooded kingfisher. Can you believe it? Um, many, many years ago, a grey hooded kingfisher was found and hung around for a while before disappearing. Uh, I mentioned the Namako warbler, and this is a, a wonderful place to get the endemic Namako warbler, is in the reed beds along the, along the Mordor River section of Sudura Nature Reserve. Um, they're very common, you hear them calling a lot, and uh, if you're patient, you can see them coming out and you know, chasing one another in amongst the reeds. Uh, little orange river white eyes all over the place. Um, this time of the year, they're uh, starting to sing and um, very, very busy and, and, and very loud song and uh, for, for such a small bird, um, but always a delight to connect with orange river white eyes. I'm sure many of you um, will recognize this spot. This is the spot. Um, I'm sure many of you will be able to relate to these two slides, waiting, 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 waiting anxiously. Some people unfortunately uh, left um, unsuccessfully uh, despite waiting and waiting and waiting. But Thankfully, most people got to see our most recent celebrity. This is the Madagascan cuckoo. And uh, we wait in anticipation this year to see if it's going to return for a third summer uh, in succession. Um, so this bird was present in the summer of 2020, uh, the summer of 2021, and hopefully it'll be back again in 2022. Um, it looks just like an, an African or European cuckoo, common cuckoo, but of course it was calling, it was singing. And um, the photograph of the, of the bird in the top right is of a bird calling. And that's how we were able to clinch that it was in, in fact a Madagascan cuckoo. And um, yeah, it was great. I know a number of people who tuned in this evening actually came down for the uh, Madagascan cuckoo. And I had the, I had the privilege of spending time in, uh, in the field with them. Uh, sharing the experience and uh, and sharing the the delight of another lifer, of a quite a special lifer, and uh, of course Andrew was was one of those people. So, um, you know, great memories, and uh, yeah, it was fascinating. You know, learning about the habits of this particular individual, and being able to share that um, with other people, with other birders as well. So. Um, this hasn't been the only uh, celebrity that's uh, pitched up in Sudurang. There have been a number of other species and uh, or close to Sudurang. This is, uh, there's another wonderful wetland called Atsotpon. Uh, when, when it's rained, uh, you get large areas of inundated um, grassland and, and shrub, shrubby, bushy areas. And this has produced some wonderful uh, birds. This is a, 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 a young uh, Balon's Crake. Um, that uh, we get, have had good numbers of Balon's crake. We also had African crake in good numbers uh, in recent years, particularly during, uh, during years of, of good rainfall these last few summers. Um, and of course, dwarf bittern. Um, there were a number of dwarf bitterns in, uh, you know, over these last two seasons as well in the soap pond and 
close to Sudura areas. Um, uh, just a picture of the bird in, of one of the dwarf bittens in flight as well. And a couple of years ago, we um, found a group of about, I think it was 24 Caspian plovers. They were in, in, not in, in breeding plumage, they were in non-breeding plumage. But this is in December um, in very dry, scrubby uh, habitat in Sudurung. And these birds were choosing to be out there. Um, I think that the, the ambient temperature that we were measuring in our vehicles was uh, about 38 degrees on, on these days, on the, on the particular day when I photographed these birds. Um, it must have been, it must have been mid 40s to high 40s where they were out in the open. And uh, interestingly enough, these birds would fly from the open areas in the sun to the edge of the Moda River, the dam, to drink and bathe. And then rather than um, go and seek shelter in the shade, like the local double banded courses and crowned lapwings are doing, they would fly back out and go and join their mates out in the, in the, in the scorching sun. So fascinating to, um, to be able to watch and, and experience this and uh, very fortunate to be able to capture you know, them in photographs as well. So Caspian plovers, always nice to see them. We don't get them, get them very infrequently in, uh, in the Greater Bloemfontein area, but we've had them a few times out in, um, in Sutra. Another um, uh, uh, wader shorebird that we had a number of years ago was a buff-breasted sandpiper. And had it not been for a British birder being out and about one day and seeing it, we would have been none the wiser. But I know a number of people traveled some overnight to get to see it as a lifer. And uh, again, and that was that was Sudurin. Um, at the same time as we had the Madagascan cuckoo, uh, a dusky lark pitched up. And this was, as far as I know, a first record for the central interior, if not for the whole free state. So wonderful to be able to connect with dusky lark. So I think the thing is, um, you know, once, if you're out in Sudurin, particularly in summer and in a good rainy season, uh, be on the lookout because there could be any number of surprises waiting to be discovered. Little bee eater, um, very rare bird in the free state. There have been a number of sightings over the last few years and recently as well of birds close to Soat Pond and further west as well. So very close to Sudura. So um, as I said, there's a saying uh, that uh, has been coined, a phrase that's been coined um, by our local birders, and that is that Sudburung always delivers. And uh, so that goes along with uh, what I've just said, is if you are visiting this area, be on the lookout for something unusual. There's bound to be some surprise waiting in store. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's such an accessible place, uh, very close to town. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of local knowledge about the birds in this area. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, it's really worthwhile stopping off uh, don't just whiz past Bloemfontein, um, spend at least a night, maybe a couple of nights so you can get a full day's birding in and um, there are all sorts of interesting things to be seen here. I'd just like to thank uh, Trevor, Mark and, and Johan for allowing me to use some of their photographs. Uh, it's always good to have um, excellent imagery and presentations such as these. And um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, tuning in this evening, for joining us. And uh, I sincerely hope that, um, yeah, I've, I've uh, you know, shown a different side of the central free state, its birds and its birding. And, uh, and I hope to hear from folks in future, uh, you know, passing through and, um, yeah, make a plan, uh, arrange to spend a bit of time um, enjoying the birding delights of this area. Just some contact details. Um, I'm on Facebook, on Instagram, and there's my email address. And um, please, I'd be more than happy to, uh, yeah, you know, provide information, help anybody um, out, you know, give advice, anything with regard to, you know, birds and birding in this area. Andrew, thank you very much. Thanks to you, Rick. Um, uh, you say that Sid Durang always delivers, um, and I would say that Rick Knuckle always delivers too. <laughs> <laughs>
Wow, you, thanks. <laughs> you, you never fail to to wow us with your knowledge and your presentations, and as you say, so beautifully illustrated. So thank you to the photographers, and I'm sure a few, many of those images are also yours. Um, so thank Indeed, you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you so much for putting all that effort, all that time into making this presentation. I think we will have quite a few Bloemfontein converts, and the more people that spend time in that area, the more gems that are going to be uncovered. And the more the more things we'll have to talk about next time. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, really great to to have your experience and wisdom and, and have you share it so so generously with us. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Huge pleasure. All right, everyone. Can, so I, can I stop? Yeah. Can I stop share here? Yes, you may. I'm going to take over sharing. There we go. And um, get my last little slides up here. So next week, uh, before we do get into the questions, this next week we have. Bronwyn Marie talking. She's our East Atlantic Flower Initiative Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa. And she's going to be talking about the work she does, linking up the various uh, countries and partners and conservation uh, projects across the East Atlantic Migratory Flyway. So a few of those birds that Rick was talking about to make use of that flyway, of course. And uh, Bronwyn's heavily involved. Actually, she's a leader in that space of conserving these birds. And so quite an ask when you take into account all the different governments, all the different role players, stakeholders, um, all along the migratory flyway. So do tune in next week, um, of course, 7 p.m. every Tuesday night. And uh, yeah, those are the rest of our webinars for the rest of the month. While those are, are rolling, I think we'll get into some questions if you're ready, Rick. Um, Absolutely. There's one here from Andrew Pike, which I anticipate you'll have a bit of joy answering. Um, he's asked, uh, what are the parallel specials in the ways of butterflies, reptiles, dragonflies, etc.? Um, some of the other winged creatures to be found in in Bloemfontein, as well as some of the some of the reptiles and other other smaller smaller things that people can encounter. Yeah, um, indeed. You know, it's not only the birds; it's many, many, many other winged things. Um, yeah, dragonflies, uh, you know, things that come to mind. Um, uh, wonderful discovery of, a, of, of twisters, um, a species that, uh, you know, if, if you look at the distribution maps, you, you they, sh they simply shouldn't be here. In fact, the number of species that simply shouldn't be here. But I think that's just because people, uh, you know, there have, they haven't really been people studying and looking at the Odonata in, in these areas. Um, but yeah, a number of years ago, uh, a couple of friends um, actually pointed out and, and, and I went and confirmed uh, identification of twisters and, you know, they crepuscular um, pretty much late afternoon, early morning, uh, early evening, early morning, and um, only, you know, late into December and into January. Those are the only times that I've seen them, but they uh, occur on a number, on two of the dams here on the estate where I live. So uh, if anybody's you know, keen on 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 uh, trying to find twisters in terms of dragonflies. We also get yellow veined widows. Um, you know, one of our smaller dragonflies, stunning little little dragonflies, both the male and the female. Um, uh, there there are a number of there are a number of many many different species um, butterflies. Yeah, uh, we 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 get some very special species here. Some of the sapphires, the um, Barker's sapphire. Um, yeah, uh, I spent time on, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a patch of yellow daisies during lockdown or just after lockdown, um, trying to document with my camera the, uh, the species moving through with the brown veined whites as they were, the um, uh, um, caper whites. Uh, number of different species. It's not just, uh, it's not, just not, not just the brown veined whites that are moving. And um, yeah, there's some groundbreaking research being done by lepidopsis in South Africa on this whole phenomenon of uh, what some people call a migration, but it's in fact a movement because uh, we still don't know. I mean, normally a migration would be, um, you know, a particular organisms going from a non-breeding area to a breeding area and then returning. Uh, of course, these uh, these butterflies don't do that. They don't return. They're flying in a northeasterly direction one way. Um, but what is fascinating is that 
um, a number of other species are also getting in on the act. And I think I photographed seven or eight different species uh, at the time of the brown veined whites moving through. Um, yeah, gee, uh, so many different things to, um, you know, to, to look for in these areas. So, yeah, I hope that uh, I've, I've given some quite specific answers to that question, but uh, yes, uh, you know, more than welcome to continue the discussion. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a world that I'm only starting to dip my toe into now, butterflies and dragonflies. And, um, for me, I mean, if there's any people out there who are interested but don't know how to get into it, I've found iNaturalist a really good uh, tool to use mostly because you just post a photograph and other people tell you what you're looking at. So you can save yourself the paging through the books um, while you learn the, the common species around you. But great to explore. I've always found, even with my, my birding and my atlasing, going to areas that are completely unknown from a birding perspective and just exploring, and you, you're bound to find great stuff that um, turns up. So, yeah, really cool to, to have so many more people aware about what's going on in, in Bloemfontein. Um, there's a few sort of quite species specific questions. We'll just knock through those. So Pauline Jackson would like to know how common spike yield logs are in the area and also sort of towards Karenboom. Spike yield larks are very, very common around Bloemfontein. Um, yeah, uh, I didn't even include them in, in, in the Sudurin, you know, aspects of this presentation. Um, that's a great spot, but you know, yeah, you you can pick them up anywhere around Bloom, where you get to an area uh, which is yeah grassland, but with 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 patches of open ground. They like the open ground, um, and yeah, very very spike yield is a is a very common lark species in the Free State, and as you go further south and getting more into the Karoo areas, so around Karangboom, Springfontein. Uh, very common indeed. So if you're looking for it, you are bound to find it. Yeah, as always, knowing the call helps a whole lot too. Mm. So do you go and uh, listen to that on your app or on Zeno Canto, or you'll probably find some of Rick's recording on Zeno Canto, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, one from Etienne Henriksen. Uh, he asks, is October too early for the melodious larks? Um, We'll get through that one first, and then he has a list of other birds after that. Okay. Etienne, good to hear from you, and my apologies for not getting back in, in, into contact. Uh, life's been a bit hectic, as you know. I've been, I've been out of town and away. Um, but yes, uh, melodious larks are, are up and about already. So um, if you're planning to come through end of October, uh, it's, it's an ideal time to be here for melodious larks. And yeah, um, Let's let's hear the others. Uh, okay, they were lark like bunting, lesser kestrel, red footed falcon, and temix courses. Okay, all of those those four are are difficult. I'll tell you why. I think lark like bunting, particularly we've we've had some good rainfall seasons, and lark like buntings um, tend to stay further away, further to the west in the in the semi arid and arid areas. Um, unless it's been a very dry period. So during dry periods, we might, uh, just might be able to pick them up, you know, not too far from Bloemfontein, west of here, but at the moment, our chances of finding lark like bunting, you know, nearby, even that site that I was talking about where the blue cranes are and the um, Temmings courses and Birchall's courses is about 50 k's west of here. You might pick up lark like buntings there. Um, but it, it'll be a very difficult, I can't, you know, I wouldn't be able to guarantee a sighting uh, of it um, at, this, at this stage after such a good, uh, after such a good rain season last summer. Um, Temmings Corsa, you know, the Afrikaans name is Trek Draverki, and they trek, you know, as, as many people say, birds have wings and they fly. Um, the Temmings Corsa is a very difficult bird to, to nail down. Um, we do see them from time to time at a particular spot in Sudurung. So if you are planning to come through, uh, you know, that would, would be one of the spots we'd go and look. Um, but again, it's not one that can be guaranteed. Um, they do tend to be around more in drier years as well. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, Etienne, you've, you've chosen a, a particularly wet year 
to do uh, to do this challenge of yours. Uh, lesser kestrels, I don't know if they will be around by the end of October. Um, they again, they their arrival is very much dependent on on where the rain has fallen, and they tend to follow the rain fronts. So, if there's been good rainfall up in the northern parts of the country, their uh, their arrival down here in the central free state is delayed. Um, or it could be that they, you know, that they, there's been good rainfall in the eastern free state and, and they head off that way and they don't come to the Bloemfontein, greater Bloemfontein area. So, you know, we can look back at records and over the last number of years and try and work out, you know, when is the earliest that they, uh, you know, that they do arrive. But by end of October might still be a little bit early for them. You might just, might just get them. Um, and the other one, the fourth one, oh, red-footed uh, falcon. Gee, that's a, you know, they, as I, as I think I mentioned, there'll be a smattering of those, you know, from year to year in the roost. Um, so, yeah, that's a very, very difficult one. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, um, you know, um, advise you to, you know, set your heart on seeing red-footed falcon here in the Bloemfontein area, I'm afraid. Well, there's some local knowledge for you, uh, Etienne. Then there's uh, two questions from Andrew Pike just to close out. So the first one, are there any specials from Lesotho, Peru, Kalahari that creep into the Bloom area? Example, Great Tith. I think you did mention a few few of those specials like Kalahari, Scrub, Robin, etc. But any comments around that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, Great Tith. Um more to the southwestern free state, not so much around, uh, around Bloom um as you get further west it's an interesting you know phenomenon these birds that occur in lesotho in the highlands of lesotho and then uh, and then you get them down in the in the western karoo or the central and western karoo but not in between um uh, great tit is, is is one of them you you get a particularly large cape white eye subspecies that occurs up there i did mention that we get cape white eyes moving in here seasonally mm -hmm. and interestingly enough from my experience, what they're coming in for is the fruiting cotoneaster, uh, ornamental cotoneasters in the gardens and uh, growing in the, planted along the middle of the, of the freeway and the islands of the freeway. Um, we lived in a, in a, um, you know, in a house in the western, uh, westernmost part of town and our neighbors had a big cotoneaster bush and every year I would pick up you know the Cape White House mainly on call I'd pick them up on call first and they'd be around for a couple of months while those cotoneasters were in fruit um sorry that's a, an aside but you get the Cape White Eyes that are up in the in the highlands of Lesotho as well I mentioned the um uh sickle wing chats I think that they move down from the highlands uh, um uh, ringing studies have shown that Malachite sunbirds um move between uh, the Eastern Free State and possibly the Lesotho Highlands where they've been nectaring on, on the uh, Nifophias, the red-hot pokers that are bound in, in certain times of the year. And then they move down and, and you know, into the lower lying areas, including the Central Free State. We had birds that were ringed in, uh, in the Fixburg district that were actually, or ringed in our botanical gardens here and, um, and re-trapped in the Fixburg area in the Eastern Free State. So that's another interesting one. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if the fairy flycatchers would do the same, moving from the highlands of Lesotho, um, coming in here, or whether we, our birds are coming from the Karoo, where they, where they breed. So, um, yeah, some very interesting questions. For sure. Last one here, also from Andrew, is uh, how common are the rufous cheek night jars in summer? Um, specific question again, and then he just adds on, Thank you so much for uh, sharing your immense knowledge and experience. Andrew, it's an absolute pleasure. It's, uh, it's what I like to do. <laughs> it's what I love doing, in fact. And thanks for your interesting questions. Rufus Chick Nightjar, uh, good chances of getting them in summer. They, um, they are, they'll, they'll be arriving fairly soon and then we hear them and um, yeah, we have them breeding. And um, so there's a good chance of seeing them in summer. And just as an aside, um, go and have a look at the uh, Bird Atlas um, uh, distribution map for freckled nightjar, and you'll see a little spot uh, on the outskirts of Bloemfontein, and that's in fact in the rocky areas in, in the state where I live. Um, it's a garden bird. It's a I, I'm hear them calling 
every evening and early in the morning here at the moment. So it's amazing what uh, what you find if you if you spend focused time in an area. But um, you know, freckled night jars on the outskirts of Bloemfontein as well. So um, not an easy bird to get. We try on birding big day, but we only have a certain window of time, an amount of time. And uh, we don't always get them, but uh, they, they are here. So that's another interesting one. As you say, the more you scratch around, the more wonderful things you seem to turn up. So I think that's a nice theme to leave this webinar on. I think you've taken an area which a lot of people haven't appreciated from a birding perspective and really put it on the map. So hopefully there's a whole lot more people that uh, decide to stop over and actually spend some time and enjoy what Lundfontein has to offer. And of course, if you are still watching and you want to get hold of Rick um, and you didn't copy down his uh, contact details, um, I'll paste them in, or Rick, if you can put them in the chat uh, just quickly now, and also people can pick them up on the recording. So um, we'll be able to watch that back tomorrow afternoon, but Rick will quickly put that in the, in the chat for everyone, just, just in case you still want those. So yeah, well, all that's left to say is, again, thank you so much, Rick. It's always a pleasure having you on. Thank you for being such a big supporter of BirdLife South Africa. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, funny bird that pitches up in Swift Dury. <laughs> Great, Andrew. Thank you so much. And, and thanks once again to those who are, who are still with us. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, it's always great to share one's passion. So um, hopefully we'll see uh, a lot more of you coming and spending time birding in this in this area. Thanks so much. All the best. Wonderful. I'll leave the Zoom room open just for another minute or two for people to pop any messages in the chat and take down your details and then I'll close it up from there. Good evening, everyone.